Here we'll work out a formula for the instantaneous slope of a function. Here's a function, and here's a point on that function. Which of these lines is the tangent line for the function at this point? Around this point here, the function looks sort of like this. If we were to zoom in even further, the function would look basically like this there. It would look exactly like a line. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference because the curvature would be very, very slight. Which line does it look like? Well, it looks the most like D out of these choices here, so we call that the tangent line. Right, D is the tangent line. Now the slope of this tangent line is called the instantaneous slope of the function at this point. In this tutorial, we'll come up with a formula for the instantaneous slope of a function. But let's put some numbers in here to help us think about this. Let's suppose that the x-coordinate of this point is 2. And let's draw a line that goes through this point and then hits the function again over here, where x equals 5. What's the slope of this line? In order to find the slope of this line, we need to know the x and y coordinates of these two points. The x coordinates are labeled down here, but the y coordinates are not. What's the y coordinate for 2? Well, it's the number that comes out when you put 2 into the function, so that's actually just f of 2. The y coordinate for 5 is f of 5. So now, to find the slope, we can just take the y-coordinate of the second point minus the y-coordinate of the first point and divide it by the x-coordinate of the second point minus the x-coordinate of the first point. That comes out to be y2, we'll say the second point is 5, so it's f of 5. y1 is f of 2, so this is y2, and that's y1. And x2 is 5, and x1 is 2. So this comes out to f of 5 minus f of 2 divided by 3. Exactly. Let's quickly see how you got that. To find the slope, you need the y-coordinates of these two points. Their y-coordinates are f of 2 and f of 5. Now the slope of a line is the difference between the y-coordinates divided by the difference between the x-coordinates. So that's f of 5 minus f of 2 over 5 minus 2. And 5 minus 2 is 3. So this is the expression you got for the slope of this line. Now let's move this second point along the curve so that it's closer to the first point over here. Let's say we move it so that its x-coordinate is now 2.5. What's the slope of this line? Again, to find the slope, we need to know the y-coordinates of both of these points. The y-coordinate of this point here is f of 2.5. So the slope is the change in y here, which is f of 2.5 minus f of 2, divided by the change in x here, which is 2.5 minus 2. We can simplify the denominator to get f of 2.5 minus f of 2 divided by 0 0.5. Right, it's f of 2.5 minus f of 2 over 0.5. And the 0.5 in the denominator is the difference between the x-coordinates of these two points. Let's say we move the second point so that it's really, really, really close to the first point. As the two points get closer and closer together, this line connecting the points becomes the tangent line that you found earlier. Can you find an expression for the slope of this tangent line? In order to find the slope, we actually need a second point. So let's pick one nearby. Because it's nearby, we can say its x-coordinate is 2 plus a small number. Let's call it h. That makes the y-coordinate f of 2 plus a small number h. What's the slope of this line? 
Well, it's the change in y over the change in x. So the change in y is f of 2 plus h minus f of 2. And the change in x is 2 plus h minus 2. If we simplify the denominator, we get that 2 minus 2 is equal to 0. So what we're left with is just h. OK. Now, to find the slope of the tangent line, we're interested in what happens as this point gets closer and closer to that point, or as this x-coordinate gets closer and closer to that x-coordinate. Right. You can take f of 2 plus h, where h is a very small number, subtract f of 2, divide by the number h, and take this limit as h goes to 0. This is the formula for the instantaneous slope of this function at this point here, where x equals 2. Now suppose you want to find the slope somewhere else, like this point over here. Suppose it has an x-coordinate of a. What's the instantaneous slope of the function at this point? In order to find the slope, we need to find a second point. Let's choose this one here, whose x-coordinate is a plus a little bit, say a plus h. That means that the y-coordinates of these two points are f of a for the first one, it's called f the first one, and f of a plus h for the second one. That's the second one. What's the slope of this line that goes through those two points? Well, the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So here, it's going to be f of a plus h minus f of a over a plus h minus a. Doing the subtraction in the denominator is going to leave us with nothing but h. So that's the slope of this line here. Now we're interested in what happens when point 2 gets very, very close to point 1. If they're right next to each other, then we're basically going to have the slope of the tangent line. If point 2 is moving closer and closer to point 1, another way of saying that is that this x-coordinate is moving closer and closer to this x-coordinate. Which of the answer choices looks like that? Correct. We can replace the 2's in this formula with a's. So you just found the formula for the instantaneous slope of a function f when x equals a. It's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. In this tutorial, we'll introduce something you'll commonly see with derivatives, dx. First off, consider the function y of x. How can you write the derivative of this function? Exactly. You can write the derivative of y of x as y prime of x. There are a few other ways to write down the derivative of a function. Here's one way. This d over dx here means you're taking the derivative of whatever function is in the parentheses after it. And here's one more way. You can read this as dy over dx, or as dy dx. All three of these expressions mean the derivative of y. Let's focus on this expression here, dy dx, and see why this is used to mean the derivative. Let's say that this is a graph of the function y. And let's look at any point on the function, like this point here dx usually refers to a very small change in the value of x, and dy refers to the corresponding small change in y. Let's draw the tangent line at this point. We said dx and dy represent small changes in x and y, so let's make dx really, really small. In terms of dx and dy, what's the slope of this tangent line? Remember that if you have a line, the slope 
between any two points is given by the change in y, you could write that as delta y, divided by the change in x. You could write that as delta x. So the slope is delta y over delta x. Here, instead of delta y, we have dy, and instead of delta x, we have dx. What does that make the slope? Right. As dx and dy get really, really small, dy divided by dx approaches the slope of the tangent line. And the slope of the tangent line is the derivative of the function y at this point. So that's why dy over dx is used to represent the derivative. When you see dy dx, you can think of how a small change in x results in a small change in y. Now let's go back to our function, y of x. Suppose instead that we had a different function, p. And let's say that the input for p is a variable q. How could you write the derivative of this function, p? We can still use all three of these expressions, but now we want to change all of the x's, the inputs, to q's, and all of the y's, the outputs, to p's. Yes, you can write the derivative of p as p prime of q, or as d over dq of p, or as dp dq. The input of a function doesn't always have to be called x, so you won't always see a dx in these expressions for the derivative. Because it's not always clear what the input of a function might be, the clearest way to read these expressions is to say the derivative of p with respect to q. Let's look at a real-world example. Here's a graph of how far an Olympic sprinter travels when running the 100-meter dash. t is the variable we'll use to represent time, and z is the distance the runner has traveled. So z is 0 at the starting line and 100 at the finish line. It looks like this sprinter took about 10 seconds to run the race. Let's look at a short time interval over here and the associated change in distance. This change in time we can call dt, and the change in distance we'll call dz. How would you write the derivative of this function? Exactly right. The derivative is dz dt. And there are other ways to write this same derivative. We could write it as d over dt of z, and also as z prime of t. All three of these expressions mean the same thing, the derivative of this function z with respect to t. Now what would you say is the significance of dz dt in this graph? dz dt tells us how far a runner goes in some amount of time, and dt is how long it takes him. So if dz divided by dt is very big, that means he's gone very far in a short amount of time. And if dz divided by dt is very small, that means he's not gone very far in a long amount of time. Another way of saying that is if dz dt is big, he's going very fast, and if dz dt is small, he's going very slow. Nicely done. Yes, dz dt, the derivative of this graph, represents the runner's speed. Speed is a measure of how fast you're traveling, meaning how far you move divided by how long it took. So if you divide the change in distance, dz, by the change in time, dt, that gives you the runner's instantaneous speed, meaning the speed at this point here. So the derivative of this graph is the runner's speed. Early in the race, the derivative is smaller, and as the race goes on, the derivative is increasing, meaning the runner is getting faster. Now the units for distance are meters, and the units for time are seconds. So what are the units for the derivative, dz dt? z is a distance measured in meters, so dz, a little bit of distance, is also going to be measured in meters. d 
dt is a little bit of time, and time is measured in seconds here. So dt is going to be measured in seconds. When we take dz and divide it by dt, we're going to be taking meters and dividing them by seconds. So the units of dz dt are meters per second. Exactly. The runner's speed, dz dt, has units of meters divided by seconds, which you can also read as meters per second. When you see terms like dz and dt, they have the same units as z and t. dz has units of meters, and dt has units of seconds. dt refers to a very short time interval, but it's still a time interval, so it has units of seconds. And similarly, dz refers to a small change in distance, so it has units of meters in this example. So keep that in mind as you work with dx's when writing derivatives. The dx actually means something and has the same units as x.